Hi, hello, welcome to the episode of Isaiah's Newsstand. It's your host, Isaiah Edwards. The date is December the 24th, 2023. Hopefully this episode finds you well in good spirits and high hopes. As for me, I'm doing pretty good. I got some grocery shopping in. I started a little bit late. I was kind of trying to thread the needle a bit because I was like, hopefully, I know it's going to be busy, but I need to like potentially interact with the butcher because I got to get the specific kind of meat. And then it turns out I didn't have to talk to the butcher at all and I got anxious for nothing. But that's okay. Um, also, I got some gingerbread men and that was fun. That was yummy. I figured I'd get a little seasonal. Uh, holidays got to me a little bit. Merry Christmas or, you know, Merry Christmas Eve. You know, we're going to get there. Um, but yeah, uh, so I did that. Uh, but Food Corner, I um, I went to Problematic Chick-fil-A and I got the Peppermint Mocha Milkshake. Uh, that's like a seasonal treat for myself that I pretty much get year round. And then I also got a large fry with the Polynesian sauce and I ate it in the parking lot and it was really yummy. And that's part one. Then I went and ordered some Domino's. That's right. I went crawling back. I forgave them for the pan pizza. And that, that was my fault. That was my bad, you know? But hey, um, this was much better. We went hand tossed. It was so much. It was so good. So I got a sausage and pineapple pizza. And then I got a jalapeno and onion pizza. And I had a barbecue sauce base. So that worked out very well. Gobbled it all up. Felt very, very fat afterwards. But um, it was worth it. Yes, 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 yes. So yeah, that's Food Corner. That's uh, pretty much where we're at. I caught with all my Joneses. Um, we'll go ahead and skip the startup. We're going to go ahead and get right into the news. Um, so my computer cooperates. Okay. From CNN. Pentagon says chemical tanker struck by Iranian drone in Indian Ocean. A chemical tanker operating in the Indian Ocean was struck by an Iranian attack drone Saturday, a U.S. Department of Defense official said. The seventh Iranian attack on commercial shipping since 2021. The motor vessel Kim Pluto a Liberia-flagged, Japanese-owned, and Netherlands-operated chemical tanker was struck at approximately 10 a.m. local time, 6 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time, today in the Indian Ocean, 200 nautical miles from the coast of India, by a one-way attack drone fired from Iran, the official said in a statement. Um, The one-way attack drone is designed to impact its target rather than return to its origin. There were no casualties and a fire on board. Uh, The tanker has been extinguished, the defense um, official said. No U.S. Navy vessels were in the vicinity, um, adding Naval Forces uh, Central Command was communicating with the struck vessel. But um, initially, or eventually some uh, patrol and maritime, maritime surveillance, um, they wound up getting um, assistance, and then they were escorted back, you know, to uh, their location they needed to go to. But um, this has kind of an, been an ongoing thing. I say kind of. I think there's been like a hundred attacks since uh, October seventh. So you know, this has really been ratcheted up by um, who the rebels. Uh, The strike in the Indian Ocean comes as Iran-backed Houthi rebels in Yemen have launched more than 100 attacks against about a dozen commercial and merchant ships transiting the Red Sea over the past four weeks, uh, CNN previously reported. The U.S. Central Command reported more such incidents in a statement on social media, A crude oil tanker was hit by a one-way attack drone Saturday. There were no injuries. A separate chemical tanker operating in the Southern Red Sea reported a near-miss Saturday from a one-way drone, the command said. Uh, Also, anti-ship ballistic missiles were fired into the Southern Red Sea from Houthi-controlled areas of Yemen, 
but did not hit any vessels, the statement said. And the USS Laboon, a Navy destroyer, shot down four aerial drones that were heading toward it. Um, so yeah, I mean, it doesn't seem like this has really been rationing down. I know I referenced that, um, the U.S. is saying, hey, we're going to get some kind of maritime, you know, um, pressure out there. We're going to get more, you know, ships out there. Um, the U.S. this week launched Operation Prosperity Guardian, a maritime coalition aimed at beefing up security in the Southern Red Sea. More than 20 nations have signed on to the initiative so far, the Pentagon said Thursday. But this has kind of been something that I kind of think is like, hey, that's people putting pens to paper. You know, that's good and all. But we'll kind of wait and see how committed, you know, these people who are signing on saying, yeah, yeah, we'll totally support because it seems like in a lot of the situation, it's like, okay, well, if, if the U.S. is going to back this shit to the hilt, that's fine. But they should be the first to foot the bill, and they should be doing the foremost to foot the bill. Why are we doing that? But at the same time, everyone's kind of involved in this because it's like we all have like a financial stake in terms of like the shipping routes, in terms of the Red Sea. Like I said in previous episode, like, yeah, the talk is like, yeah, you know, sure, we have to reroute and all this kind of stuff. We can't afford the insurance or the insurance isn't going to come through for the shipping for the ships. But we're not going to foot the bill. Who's going to foot the bill? The customer. So naturally, you know, they're saying this. They don't really want to make that shit happen. So eventually you're maybe going to see um, more than just the U.S. actually out on the Red Sea, Indian Ocean, you know, doing more patrols, things of that nature. Uh, but let's get to the part two of this, um, because, you know, same day, same Saturday, um, i scroll up again, uh, from Reuters, Yemen's warring parties commit to ceasefire steps, UN Special Envoy says. The Saudi-backed Yemen, Yemeni government and Iran-aligned Houthis have both committed to steps towards a ceasefire, the UN Special Envoy for Yemen said on Saturday. The Houthis, which control North Yemen, have been fighting against a Saudi-led military alliance since 2015 in a conflict that has killed hundreds of thousands and left 80% of Yemen's population dependent on humanitarian aid. The UN Special Envoy Hans Grundberg, in a statement issued by his office, said he welcomes the party's commitment to a set of measures to implement a nationwide ceasefire improve limit conditions in Yemen and engage in preparations for the resumption of an inclusive political process under the UN auspices. Um, I mean, we'll see how this goes. Um, I mean, this kind of sounds like maybe pillow we talk and hopefully it's something that it sticks and it is concrete, but it also might be something that breaks apart and, you know, that's the latest kind of resume as usual. Also, I think it is kind of interpreted as well that um, the ceasefire talk is going to be leading to, you know, less of these or, you know, stopping all of this kind of um, missile and drone strike action that is kind of happening in the Red Sea and in the ocean. But the Houthi rebels have kind of said, no, well, we're doing this, you know, until, you know, the situation in Gaza stops and changes. So, I mean, we'll see. I don't know. Um Sure, there's some more I might want to read here. Uh, yeah, there's a little bit of history here. The Saudi led military coalition intervened more than eight years ago against the Houthi movement after it ousted Yemen's internationally recognized Saudi backed government from Sina, from Sina, the capital in 2014. The Saudi backed government's foreign ministry welcomed the special envoy statement on the efforts made to reach a roadmap under the auspices of the United Nations to end the war caused by the Houthi militia, Yemeni state news agency Saba reported. Um, Also, I was listening to the BBC, and they said that, like, hey, behind the scenes, um, on the Saudi side, they've kind of been telling, like, the U.S., hey, just stick to like being very defensive, shooting down these kind of things, not really like being, you know, counter aggressive back to anyone shooting at you because we're trying to work out a ceasefire. So, you know, saying like, hey, we're really trying to work this all out. We're going to try to calm things down, 
if you guys intervene in that kind of way with any kind of military action, um, that would be bad. So don't do it, please. So it's seemingly that they've kind of been playing at hand at this for maybe this reason. Um, but once again, we'll see how solid this is, how concrete this is come the future and what may come. But yeah, let's take things to Alabama from The Guardian. Alabama woman with two uteruses gives birth twice in two days. An Alabama mother with a rare double uterus has delivered a set of twins. The hospital treating her announced on Friday. And what doctors are calling a one in a million pregnancy, 32 year old Kelsey Hatcher delivered a set of twin daughters, one of whom was in each womb at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, uh, UAB hospital. Hatcher, uh, after 20 hours of labor, gave birth to Roxy Layla on Tuesday and her second daughter, Rebel Lakin, on Wednesday. She announced on Instagram. Never in our wildest dreams could we have planned a pregnancy and birth like this, but bringing our two healthy baby girls into this world safely was always the goal, and UAB helped us accomplish that, Hatcher said in um, the hospital's press release. It seems appropriate that they had two birthdays, though. They both had their own houses, and now both have their own unique birth stories, she said. Hatcher was diagnosed with uterus dedophilus, or the a double uterus, at the age of 17. The condition is a rare uterine anomaly seen only in 0.3% of women. The latest delivery is Hatcher's fourth pregnancy. She has previously delivered babies from one uterus at a time only. Weeks into this latest pregnancy, Kelsey noticed bleeding and made an appointment for an ultrasound, as those with double uteruses have higher rates of miscarriages. During the appointment, doctors discovered Hatcher had an additional fetus forming in her left uterus. So, you know, naturally she was shocked. Um, the husband was like, what? No way. Um, but sure enough, she's like, yeah, way. And, you know, luckily everything went well. She um, had Roxy Layla vaginally and then delivered Rebel Lakin via C-section. But yeah, it's good that, you know, nothing, you know, there was no hitch. There was no problem. Uh, you can say it's a bit of a Christmas miracle, if you will. So there you go. Let's, let's chop it up for that. Yay. Um, let's see here. We have one more story to cover before I let you go into that uh, Christmas night or, you know, whenever you listen to this. Um, let me go ahead and actually take my break. Also, sorry if you hear a fire alarm or any like loud noises. You know, it's the city, it's the apartment, and, you know, the studio, <laughs> whatever. Um, Ooh-wee. Mm. Okay. From the Associated Press. New York bill could interfere with Chick-fil-A's long-standing policy to close Sundays. So we're starting with Chick-fil-A. We're ending with Chick-fil-A. New York lawmakers have introduced a bill that will require restaurants in state highway system rest areas to operate seven days a week. A measure apparently aimed at interfering with a policy at the fast food chain Chick-fil-A of staying closed on Sundays. The bill introduced last week is yet another salvo in a years-long political battle involving the company whose late founder, Truett Cathy, infused its business practices with his conservative Christian values. Loved by many for its chicken sandwiches, but disliked by others over its founder's opposition to same-sex marriage, Chick-fil-A has always kept its locations closed on Sunday so employees can enjoy time with their families and worship if they choose, according to the company's website. While the bill, if passed, would apply to all restaurants, Chick-fil-A is mentioned by name in some written legislative materials explaining the justification for the 
uh, proposed law. State Assembly member Tony Simone, the Democrat who introduced the bill, said it is meant to give travelers in New York a variety of food options. Um, though I think more or less um, in the rest area situations, like there's still there's Chick-fil-A and then another option. So to me, it's just weird, like why you would accept the contract or like the, the leasing or whatever for Chick-fil-A to be there. If you like what you could have easily just had a McDonald's, a Burger King, Wendy's, but you're like, no, well, I guess we'll just have Chick-fil-A, which we know it's gonna be closed on Sunday, but now we're going to be actually kind of mad about that. I don't know. This kind of seems a little bit far flung, whatever. You're kind of just kind of doing it for points. Maybe. I mean, Hey, go off, I guess. Um, now the bill wouldn't immediately apply to restaurants currently operating, meaning the impact on existing Chick-fil-A locations would be limited, but would affect all future contracts for food concessions at transportation facilities owned by the state and the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. It would exclude temporary concessions like farmer's markets. So it's already feel like this has holes in it in terms of making it actually happen. Um, I don't know, uh, you know. I know Chick-fil-A has, you know, caught flack before because, you know, obviously it came out that it's like they were avidly supporting, um, like, uh, opposition legalization bills and things of that nature. Uh, Chick-fil-A became the subject of boycotts in 2012 over its deep financial support of opposing legislation of same-sex marriage. Over the years, over the years, the chain, which operates more than three thousand locations, scaled back its location, uh, scaled back its financial support before ending it in twenty nineteen. Um, in the past, airports in Buffalo, San Antonio, Texas, have blocked Chick Fil A, uh, a form um, or Chick Fil A from opening at their states. Some college campuses have also banned the chain. Uh, but um, Texas uh, Governor Greg Abbott signed a bill in 2019 in defense of Chick-fil-A and religious freedom. So that that, that lines up quite perfectly. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Chick-fil-A has been embroiled in, you know, a lot of controversy. I guess now they're like saying, hey, you got to keep your shit open. No more clothes on Sunday, at least at rest areas. But I, I really don't think this is going to have any legs. You could say this is a nothing burger. But I was like, hey, I want to talk about it. You know, I had Chick-fil-A on the brain. So uh, that'll be it. That's the episode. Um, if you'd like to help out, like to support, you can. I do have a Patreon, patreon.com, such as AN News. Uh, you become a newsy. I shout you out at the top of the month. And uh, say your name or plug a project if you'd like. And then also you can hit me up at news one at gmail.com and I'm on all the socials you're on or the podcast. Feel free to hit me up, hit the podcast up. Also, hopefully you're subscribed to the YouTube, all the subscriptions. That helps out a lot. Liking, subscribing, hitting that bell helps out a lot. And cool comments. Those are always great. Uh, And you can do that on the YouTube or any listening app you're currently partaking in. So, yeah. Um, Thank you so much for tuning in. Thanks so much for being a friend. And hopefully I see you soon for some more good news. I love you. Bye-bye.